Okay, we're going to start uh, today talking about a basis for a vector space. And the idea of a basis is that it's a minimal in terms of number of vectors and uh, representative uh, in that it represents the vector space uh, set. So it's a minimal representative set. So let's explore uh, what that actually means. Um, before we really get into that, let's back up a little bit and uh, remember uh, what a couple of concepts are that are key here. One is linear independence and the other is spanning. So let's start with linear independence. So here's a definition. A set of vectors, uh, V1 through Vp, is said to be linearly independent if the only solution to the equation uh, where you take a linear combination of the vectors and set it equal to zero, okay, this linear combination set equal to zero, the only solution to that is when you set all the coefficients equal to zero. Okay, note that uh, this is always a solution. We can always set the coefficients equal to zero and uh, generate the zero vector. What we want to know is if this is the only solution. So uh, thinking in terms of a systems of e system of equations, uh, we know the system's consistent. We want to know if uh, this, the solution is unique or if there are an infinite number of solutions. So that's when we get into talking about free variables. Does the system have a free variable or not? Okay, so we set up that augmented uh, matrix for that system. Um, we put it in echelon form, and we want to see if there are free variables, right? Because if there are free variables, that means an infinite number of solutions, and the, and the vectors would not be linearly independent. And uh, if we don't have free variables, that means uh, the solution is unique, so the vectors are linearly independent. Okay, so to check for linear independence, uh, we, we really don't have to tack on that, that zero column on the uh, augmented side. We can just look at the coefficient matrix, put it in echelon form, and see if there's a pivot position in every column. Okay, because we want to know are there free variables or not. So is there a pivot position in every column? Okay, there are a few um, uh, cases that are obvious. Uh, one is where you have more uh, vectors than you have entries in each vector, like this matrix given here. These the three vectors could not be linearly independent because you have three vectors in R2. There's no way you can have a pivot position into each column. Um, if you just have two vectors, they're linearly independent if neither is a multiple of the other. And in general, a set of vectors is linearly independent if none, okay, can't find any of the vectors in the set that can be written as a linear combination of the others. Alright, let's move on to spanning sets. Um, take that same set of vectors, V1 through Vp, and assume they're in Rn. And they are said to span Rn if the equation, where we take a linear combination of those vectors and set it equal to B, is consistent for every B in Rn. Okay, that means you can take a linear combination of those vectors and generate any vector in Rn. Now, obviously, we can't solve this system for every B in uh, Rn. That should be Rn, not Rm. Um, so how do we know if it's going to be consistent uh, for every B or not, right? Then the linear uh, independence, right-hand side was zero. We can solve that system. But here, we want it to be consistent for every B, okay? So we can't go and plug in every possible vector B on the right and solve the system to see if it's going to be consistent for everyone. So what do we do? Well, we know that it will be uh, consistent if we never end up with a row where we've got all zeros and then something not zero on the right-hand side. Um, in, when we put the matrix in uh, echelon form, right? So if we have this, okay, where all zeros and then something not zero, then it's inconsistent. So we want to 
to know if we never get that. And the way um, that that happens is uh, we have a pivot position in every row, right? If there's a pivot position in every row of the coefficient part of the matrix, okay, then you'll never end up with all zeros uh, in a row of the coefficient part of the matrix. So this, the um, so to check to see if a set of vectors is linear is uh, spans um, whatever vector space they're in, um, we need to have a pivot position in every row. Okay, so the columns of A are linearly independent if there's a pivot position in every column of A, and they span RM if there's a pivot position in every row of A. Okay, it's assuming A is an M by N matrix, so the columns are in RM. All right, so let's look at some examples. Um, here's a set with just one vector. Is it uh, linearly independent? And uh, the answer is yes, because you have a single non-zero vector. Uh, is, uh, is always going to be linearly independent, right? The only time just a single vector is linearly dependent is if that vector is the zero vector. Okay, does this set span R2? Um, and the answer is no, because uh, if you look at all linear combinations of that vector, you're just getting multiples of that vector, uh, which is a line in R2. So you only get uh, a line, not all of R2. Oops. All right, let's look at uh, this set T. Now I've got three vectors. And uh, first let's ask, is T linearly independent? And uh, the answer is no, because uh, you've got more vectors than there are entries in each vector. Right? So if you put those vectors in a matrix, there's no way you could have a pivot position in every column. Um, this, does the set span R2? Uh, yes, because uh, if you just even look at the first two vectors, they are uh, not multiples of each other, and so not collinear, so they will span the plane. Now, uh, if you want to go back and just look at it in matrix form, uh, take those vectors, put them in a matrix, put it in echelon form, and look and see. Do you have a pivot position in every column? No, so they're not linearly independent. Do you have a pivot position in every row? Yes, so they do span R2. Okay, now let's look at uh, one more set. Now this one is like the other one, except I just took out that last vector. Um, so again, is it linearly independent? Uh, yes. It's, uh, uh, we've got two vectors and neither is a multiple of the other. So they're linearly independent. Does it span R2? Notice that should be U instead of T there. Um, does it span R2? And again, it's yes uh, for the same reason that you used before. Look at it in matrix form. Um, you've got a pivot position in every row. Uh, so the vectors span R2. You have a pivot position in each column, so they're linearly independent. So we see that any set that spans R2 has to have at least two vectors, because you have to have one in each row, a uh, pivot position in each row. Um, any set that's linearly independent must have two or fewer vectors, right? Because once you get over two, you can't have a pivot position in each column. So any set that's both linearly independent and spans R2 has to have exactly two vectors, right? Exactly two. Because uh, to span, it needs at least two. To be linearly independent, it needs no more than two. So if you want both, then you have to have exactly two vectors. Uh, such a set that's both linearly independent and spans R2 is said to be a basis for R2. Um, here's a formal definition. Set of vectors uh, B1 through BP is a basis for some subspace H if the set's linearly independent and the span of the set is the subspace. Okay, so you need two pieces to be a basis. One, linear independence. The other must span the subspace. 
So let's uh, look at a few examples. Um, here's a set, and I want to know, is this a basis for R3? Um, so um, pick one of the criteria, either linearly independent or spans, and uh, see if those are satisfied. Um, so let's start off with, is it linearly independent? Well, if you uh, set up the uh, augmented matrix, set it equal to zero, um, then uh, you can clearly see you don't have a pivot position in the uh, second column here, and so can't be linearly independent. So it's not a basis. All right, about another set. There's one uh, not so clear here, uh, whether these vectors are linearly independent. Um, so we uh, put them in a matrix, do some row operations, and uh, we end up here with a coefficient matrix. Notice it has uh, a pivot position in every column. So the only solution is the trivial solution. Therefore, uh, the vectors are linearly independent. Um, we can also look at the matrix here and see that there's a pivot position in every row. Um, so they span R3, and therefore, uh, they must be a basis for R3. So the key is looking at the coefficient matrix uh, in echelon form. You can see a pivot position in every column, so they're linearly independent. Pivot position in every row, so uh, they span R3. Now here's another set. Is this a basis for R3? And uh, you're probably thinking, well, there's only two vectors, and in R3 you need three vectors to span. And that's right, because if you look at that matrix, uh, you can't have a pivot position in every row. So therefore, these vectors can't span R3, and therefore can't be a basis for R3. Now how about this one? If you look at this one, maybe you're thinking, oh, we've got four vectors in R3. They can't be linearly independent, right? Because if you put them in a matrix, um, there's no way to have a pivot position. Oops, no way to have a pivot position in every column. You've got four vectors, only three rows. Can't have a pivot position in every column, so not linearly independent. Now, here's a, a little different question. Um, here I've got four, a set of four vectors, um, and I'm not asking though, is this a basis for R3? Clearly it's not, because four vectors can't uh, be linearly independent. What I'm asking though is for you to find a, a basis for the span of this set. Okay, so we don't really know what the span of this set is. It's some uh, either all of R3 or some piece of R3. We don't know. Um, so um, we want to know um, whatever that space is, uh, what is the basis for it? Well, you know, one of the criteria for a basis is that it spans the set. So um, clearly, if we just take all four vectors, they're going to span uh, w because that's how w is defined. So the question is are they linearly independent? And we already know that they're not uh, because uh, there's four vectors in R3. So um, remember if, since they're not linearly independent then that means that at least one of them is a linear combination of the others. And um, so one strategy would be to throw out the ones that are dependent on the others and then um, reduce that down to where we have a linearly independent set. All right. Now in this case um, I'll point out to you that the second vector here is twice the first. You can look at that. 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times negative 4, negative 8, and so forth. And the last one, okay, vector 4 here, is the sum of the first and the third. So we got 1 plus 0 gives you 1, negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1, so forth. All right, so that tells us that the second vector is dependent on the first. Okay, it's a linear combination of the first. And the last one is a linear combination of the first and the third. So it seems like we should be able to throw those out. Okay, we don't need them. 
Okay, and if we do, then we're left with these two vectors, and um, we can look at it and see that it's linearly independent because we've got two vectors that are not multiples of each other. Um, it's still a little iffy on whether this set spans the original set W, right? So because we threw out some, how do we know that these two still span uh, the subspace? Well, um, let's uh, introduce a little shortcut notation here. Let's uh, say we're going to call the four original vectors V1 through V4, all right? And uh, so any vector in the span of those vectors, or any vector in W, can be written in this form, linear combination of those four vectors, all right? Now, uh, we know, though, that V2, the second vector, was 2 times the first one. So we have this relationship here. And we know that V4 was the sum of the first and the third. So we have this relationship. So we can plug that in back up in this equation. So um, substituting for V2, we can plug in 2V1. And for V4, we can plug in V1 plus V3. And then if we do a little rearranging, we can write V as just a linear combination of V1 and V3. Okay, we've got different coefficients, but that's okay. Just needs to be a linear combination of V1 and V3. So here we've shown that any vector that was a linear combination of V1, V2, V3, V4 is also a linear combination of just V1 and V3. Therefore, um, just V1 and V3, just those two vectors, will span W, and we've already said that they're linearly independent, so therefore they are a basis for W, right? So we start off with our big set, threw out the ones that were dependent on the others, and what we were left with still spans, and it's linearly independent, so it's a basis. Now, in that problem, I told you which vectors were dependent on the others. So what can you do when that's not so obvious? Right? How can you figure out which ones are, are dependent when you can't just look at it and, and, and tell? Um, well, there's an amazing thing, and that is that when you do elementary row operations, um, the, the dependence relations among the columns are not changed. Okay. So these are the four vectors we had uh, before. And remember, the second one is two times the first. The last one is the sum of the first and the third. All right, so I put it in echelon form, and I get this matrix. And look, the second column here is two times the first, right? Two times one is two. Two times zero is zero. Two times zero is zero. And the last column is still the sum of the first and the third. One plus zero is one. 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 0 is 0. So you can take your original matrix or original vectors, throw them in a matrix, put the matrix in, in echelon form or reduced echelon form, doesn't matter. Um, and uh, in that matrix, uh, the vectors will still exhibit the same uh, relationships among each other. So what you see here is that the ones that we want to keep are the ones where we have pivot positions, okay? Because if if one, like the second one here, is dependent on the first one, there's no pivot position in column two. Column four is dependent on the first and the third. There's no pivot position in column four. So the, the uh, pivot columns indicate which columns uh, are, indicate the columns that are linearly uh, that should be independent. Pivot columns indicate the columns that are linearly independent. Okay, so those are the ones we want to keep. And we have a theorem that says that the pivot columns form a basis for the column space of A. All right, now, uh, along with this comes a warning, uh, which is to be careful to use the pivot columns of A, that is the original matrix, not uh, some echelon or reduced echelon form of A. And that's because um, elementary row operations can change the column space of a matrix. 
Okay, so we go back and look at that example one more time. Um, the column space of A, that it's all linear combinations of the columns of A, uh, is not the same as a set of all linear combinations of the columns of B. Okay, those are not the same. And so um, the uh, column spaces are not the same. For example, the first column of A is clearly in the column space of A. We take one times the first column, zero times the others, and that's what you get. But uh, that column is not in the column space of B. Why? Well, when we set up the system, we've got this right-hand side. Notice system's inconsistent because we've got all zeros and then something not zero. Okay, it's not in the column space. So the column spaces are different, therefore you can't take the pivot columns from B and say that that's a basis for the column space of A. You need to look in your echelon form or your reduced echelon form, see which ones are the pivot columns, and then go back and pull those from the original matrix. All right, here's another example. Here's a matrix and you're asked to find a basis for the column space of this matrix. So we put it in echelon form, uh, get this matrix, and notice we get pivot column in a pivot position in the first column, third column, and the fifth column. So therefore we go back and take the first, third, and fifth columns of A for a basis for the column space of A. Okay, now here's a little different question. Same matrix, you're asked to find a basis for the null space of A. All right, remember the null space, set of all solutions to AX equals zero. So let's solve AX equals zero. Um, get the same matrix here. Um, we look at the general form of the solution. Um, from the first row, we get X1. It's going to be negative 2X2 minus 4X4. X3 is going to be 7 fifths uh, X4. And from the third row, we get X5 is just equal to zero x2 and x4 free variables. So if we put that in parametric vector form, uh, we get what's given here. And um, so any vector in the null space of A can be written as a linear combination of these two vectors, right? So that means that they span the null space of A. So we've got half, we're halfway to being a basis. Still need to um, uh, show that they are linearly independent or uh, reduce the set so that we get a linearly independent set. Um, so the question is, that we know that they span, are they linearly independent? And if you just look at them, it's clear that they are because we've got two vectors that are not multiples of each other, so they must be linearly independent. So these two vectors would be a basis for the null space of A. Now, an important point is that in general, um, when you solve AX equals zero and write your solution in parametric vector form, the vectors that you get will always be linearly independent. So in fact, when you write that solution in parametric vector form, it's gonna, you've got a set of vectors that spans and they will be linearly independent. Now, why are they linearly independent? Because the only way to produce the zero vector is to set each of the free variables equal to zero. So if you go back and look at the one we were just looking at, right, if you didn't know, uh, if you can just look at that and tell that they're not multiples of each other so they're linearly independent, right, if you tried to solve the system, then notice that uh, from in the second component you've got uh, x2 plus zero would equal zero. So x2 has to be zero. Um, and x4 times one equals zero means x4 has to be zero. Because of the way these vectors are uh, produced, um, you always end up with the, the, the element that corresponds to, to the free variable. So in this case, the second component, since this is multiplied by x2. Uh, if you looked at that whole row, then um, the only solution would be to set x2 equal to 0. And similarly for x4, x4 has to be 0. So when you write your solution in parametric vector form, automatically you have a basis because they span and they're linearly independent. All right, one more uh, example 
Um, I've got three vectors here, and uh, we're given that uh, v1 minus 3v2 plus 5v3 is equal to the zero vector. And you're asked to find a basis for the span of these vectors. So again, clearly you know that if you took all three, you have a set that spans. Um, but we know from what we're given that they're not linearly independent. So we need to figure out which vectors to throw out until we get to a linearly independent set. And um, since we can write any of the three as a linear combination of the other two, right, simply solve this equation for any of the three vectors, then we could throw any of them out. Um, but it's uh, kind of a convention to uh, throw out the first one that's linearly dependent, which would be V3. And so we're left with V1 and V2. And uh, if we just look at those, we can see that they're not multiples of each other. And so therefore, the set V1, V2 is linearly independent. It still spans, and therefore, it's a basis for W.